Okay, can you see something and can you hear something? Yes, both, both is perfectly fine, so please go ahead. Okay, wonderful. Well, um, thank you all for coming. This is, I think, the first time in my life I have been in the situation where my name is on the organizer list and on the speaker list. I'm not sure what the correct protocol is. I'm, uh, uh, if it helps, I'm the organizer who did the least amount of work. So let me at least thank the other organizers for you know, doing the real work, especially Kaylin, who is uh, local and, uh, and representing Singapore here today. Uh, one other matter of uh, very important organization is that there's my bookshelf back there. And I had uh, Professor Yost's book on Riemannian geometry sitting there for many, many months. And then I stupidly took it to my office. So I cannot show off my copy today for which I'm very, very sad. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get the talk started. Um, this is a uh, work on principal components along quiver representations. I will explain all those words, I think. Uh, but the important thing is that this is joint with uh, Anna Siegel and Heather Harrington. The three of us work on the fourth floor of the Andrew Wilde building here at Oxford on completely different things. And so it was very fun that we could all get together and work on something together for, uh, for, for a few uh, months. Okay, so what do I mean by quiver representation? So we start with a quiver. It's just a finite directed graph with no limitations. Uh, finite meaning both the vertices and edges are finite and uh, no limitations in the sense of we don't require that there is at most one directed edge between a pair of vertices. So here you can see there's two vertices that are happily sharing two edges between them, both pointed in the same direction. If that one was pointing back, that would also be allowed. In fact, loops like this are just fine. No, no problem having a self edge, uh, which might be slightly different from the sorts of graphs that, that you uh, typically encounter. Um, and so how does one notate this? Uh, I think the typical thing to do is to write this quiver Q as a pair of sets E and B representing edge and vertex. And then the directionality is encoded by using these two maps, the source and target, which I'll call S and T. And so far this is very combinatorial. It's just a directed graph. And we add just to sprinkle a little bit of algebra on top of this by uh, talking about quiver representations where you replace each, um, not replace, but on top of each node, you pretend that there's a vector space sitting there. So R5, if you, work, if you like real vector spaces, like complex numbers, it could be C7. It doesn't matter, some vector space. Um, and to each edge, you put a, a linear map or a matrix, uh, if you like, pointing along the arrow from the source vector space to the target vector space. So the sizes of the matrices are basically controlled by the dimensions of the vector spaces you put on. So it's a little bit of algebra on top of a little bit of combinatorics. How complicated could this be? Well, it could get really complicated very, very fast. And um, my favorite part about this is, uh, is sort of geometric. If you, um, if you fix the dimensions in advance, if you, if you put numbers in all of these vertices on, on this quiver in front of us, then you can talk about the space of all quiver representations uh, with respect to those numbers. And, and um, so that's a beautiful space. It's got a lot of geometry to it. It's cotangent bundle is interesting. You can look at microlocal aspects of it. There's so much geometry hidden in this definition. And even more, if you start restricting the ranks of the, of the matrices that you're allowed to put on your edges, um, then you get uh, beautiful singular spaces with all sorts of discriminantal varieties and so on arising. I will not do that here. I'm just saying that there's, uh, there's a lot of geometry hidden in this. Um, and because the ingredients are so simple, um, you run into quiver representations everywhere. So this uh, workshop is called Beyond Persistent Homology, but we should at least start at Persistent Homology. Much of persistence, in fact, all of persistence, if you look at it in a certain way, is about quiver representations. There's an entire book by Steve Udo on it. Uh, if you hate persistent homology, then A, how did you get into the workshop? And B, maybe you're interested in uh, perverse sheaves. And there again, there's a, a deep connection with uh, quiver representations. Maybe you like deep learning. There's an, again, uh, connections between representations of quivers and neural networks. Here's maximum likelihood estimation. 
here is uh, tropical geometry. Uh, here is, I don't even know what that field is, but uh, semi-stable sheaves and X quiver. So that sounds scary. This is a piece from uh, Miller and Sturmfeld's book on uh, commutative algebra. So, I mean, they're just, they're, they're unavoidable. And uh, maybe if I get very, very lucky after the break, when Constantine gives his talk, you will see more graphs and Conley Morse graphs with, with Conley indices attached to nodes and, and connection matrices attached to edges. And then you'll see a new and exciting example of queer representations, even in his talk. So um, that's what the object is. And it sort of infects every area of mathematics in very exciting ways. And because there's a rich geometry, lots of other areas of mathematics are sort of conversely used to study quiver representation. So geometry is applied, algebra is applied, and so on. Okay, so what are we interested in with this uh, sort of universal looking object? Well, the, the standard question, certainly from the persistent homology side, has always been about decomposability. So you can define the direct sum of two such representations in, in sort of natural way that you have two representations of the same quiver, you direct some of the vector spaces, block diagonal the matrices, and there you go, you have a quiver representation. Um, and again, a map from one representation to the other just uh, assigns for each vertex a linear map from the vector space assigned by the first representation to the vector space assigned by the second representation that commutes with everything it could possibly be required to commute with. Um, and we say that a quiver representation is indecomposable if there's no exciting way to decompose it into a direct sum. There's always a stupid way uh, of doing it with trivial vector spaces. Um, okay, and the big theorem that started all of this quiver representation theory off was uh, is by Gabriel, who invented the whole theory more or less, uh, saying that the uh, indecomposable representations of Q are finite if and only if Q has one of these very restricted formats. And I put the, so these are, uh, this one over here is the type A Dinkin diagram. And uh, this is the story of, you know, um, one directional, one parameter persistence. And the fact that you don't see a grid diagram here means that we cannot do uh, barcodes in, um, in 2D persistent homology, for instance. Um, so yes, if you don't have one of these graphs, life is difficult. And so what I want to talk about here is, to, uh, is, is a way to bypass decomposability. I want to say something about quivers that has nothing to do with this scary uh, decomposition theorem. Um, and ideally it should be computable and sort of statistically approachable because lots of problems lead to quivers and you don't necessarily want to decompose them because those quivers that you get in practice are not thinking diagrams. Okay, so the object of interest to me here in this talk is going to be a section. And what a section is, is you just pick a vector in every vector space so that the matrices send the vector you chose here to the vector you chose there. So it's a compatible choice of vectors in the vector space. Um, compatible meaning with respect to the maps living over the edges. And it's immediate because we're choosing one vector per vector space that this lives inside the total space. If you took the direct product of all the vector spaces assigned to all the vertices, this, um, these objects would live inside it. Um, and it, with very little work, you can show that if you have a morphism of uh, quiver representations, you get a linear map of their section spaces. So this is in fact a functor. You can show that it behaves nicely with respect to uh, composition. Um, and for those who are categorically inclined, uh, I don't know how many people in the audience today are, this is the limit of a diagram of vector spaces in the sense of category theory. So it's the universal cone. It's the biggest vector space that can map down to everything in your quiver uh, while maintaining the composition rules. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the immediate consequences of this definition that you have to have compatibility across an edge is that if you have a longer path, you're still compatible. So if you had um, some long string like this, I mean, this is a path, you, you require distinct vertices in the interior. The last two can coincide if you have a cycle and distinct edges. So if you had a path like this, then the vector you chose at the beginning, you compose the maps all the way to the end, you get the vector you chose at the end. This is the rule. And of course, this path is a cycle if the beginning and the end are, are the same if you have to come back. Um, and to each path, you can associate the composite linear map and, the, um, and then this compatibility for, extends easily from 
um, edges to longer paths. So let's say you are interested in this space of sections. Someone hands you a quiver and says, well, compute the space of sections, please. What goes wrong? Why is this even difficult, even though it looks like a very purely linear algebra problem? Well, let me tell you when it is not difficult. If you had a tree where everything, there was a root and everything pointed out from the root, then the space of sections is sort of immediately um, uh, available to you. You know what it is because there's only, you know, you, you know the vector space of the root, you know all the maps going out to everything else. So the sections have to be a choice of vector at the root. And then wherever it goes, it goes. There's nothing else to check. So, um, so this is the image of the uh, linear map which embeds the root space into the total space. That's, that's the space of sections. There's nothing else to check. Um, I'm going to call these outspanning, uh, I don't know what, out trees. They're, they're going to be called arborescences in this talk. I discovered that graph theorists love having complicated names for it and, and mutually incompatible names, but this one is beautiful. So, so instead of calling it an out tree or a directed out tree, I will just say arborescence. So when do things go wrong? Well, things go wrong when you don't have an arborescence, then you have to do some work. So these are the two examples where things go wrong. On the left is a Jordan quiver. It's just a single vertex and an edge that comes back to itself. And on the right is the Kronecker or the two Kronecker quivers. So it's just two directed edges between the same pair of vertices. And now you have to do some work, even in this very, very simple example. Uh, on the left side with the, with the Jordan quiver, you have to work because Whatever vector you choose at the vector uh, over the vertex, the edge map has to send it to itself. So you're now looking at the one eigenspace of whatever it is. And that, you know, finding one eigenspace is fixed points, not so easy. You have to do a little bit of work. Uh, and over here, uh, whatever vertex uh, vector you choose at V, both maps from U to V have to sort of land you at the same vector. So you're looking at what's called an equalizer or the kernel of the difference. So, so a, E, this matrix must send the vector at U to the same thing that A, F sends the vector at U. So these are the difficulties. And um, most of the rest of this talk is going to be about how you systematically overcome these difficulties in much more complicated quivers than, than any of the ones that I've shown here. Um, and to do this, because we're working with directed graphs, uh, I'm going to use uh, one of the tools for, for um, removing the cycle. So the first thing I want to do, the, the right-hand problem, this chronic or quiver problem we'll get to later, the thing that's annoying me right now are the cycles on the lower left. So let's get rid of those first. And we target them by using what's called an ear decomposition. This is um, uh, one of my, I mean, during this, this project, this is uh, one of my favorite things that I discovered. It's not from my field, it's from directed graph theory, but it's, it's sort of very, very amazing to me. So um, I'll start with the definition that this I learned working with Constantine. It's been over, I think, over 10 years. Uh, so these are a few tricks I picked up uh, during my PhD. Um, so we say that a graph is, uh, this directed graph is strongly connected if there is a path between any two vertices. This is much stronger than just being connected. Um, so you can get from vertex V to V prime, you can get back from V prime to V. So these are some of the worst, most cyclic possible quivers that you could, uh, uh, you could find. Um, so every cycle is certainly an example. A direct cycle is an example, but if you look at this quiver on the right and you pick your two favorite vertices, let's say U1 and what's far away for U5, so you, there is a path from U1 to U5. Let's see if we find it, U1 to U3, to U4, to U2, and then down to U5. Okay, so there's a path. And if you work very hard, actually not so hard, U5 to U4 to U2 to U1, so you can even come back. So this is true for any pair of vertices in this graph. Um, so, so here's a not, not just a cycle quiver, which is strongly connected. Um, and the goal, because I hate cycles, is to replace this with an arborescence and then somehow do surgery to, the, to a representation living on top of it so that the space of sections is the same. And the tool to do this is called an ear decomposition. Um, and this is going to be a sequence of subquivers that somehow partition all the edges. So you, you, you will have baby subquivers living inside here so that the edges are completely partitioned. Um, the first one is a vertex or a cycle and every other one is a path or a cycle. 
And then the intersection of vertices, the ith quiver with all the previous ones is just the endpoints. Um, so the source and the target. If you are a path, then there's that set as cardinality two. If you're a cycle, then that set has cardinality uh, one. Okay, so for this um, directed graph over here, what does the uh, what does an ear decomposition look like? Where well, here it is. So you have Q1, which is just this cycle, and then Q2 is this path, this blue path, and then Q3 is this light green thing over here. Um, and if you look up and down, you can do a little bit of work, and uh, it's not maybe so obvious, but but they are exactly the same graph. I think someone's unmuted, and if that's you, I am going to mute you now. Ah, oh, peace. Okay, so um, if you had a question, you can obviously unmute yourself. Um, okay, so um, it's a theorem that any strongly connected um, quiver has an ear decomposition. It's an if and only if. So anytime you have some uh, something uh, where you can get a quiver where you can get from one vertex to the other with a path, there it also has an ear decomposition. And so we're going to exploit this to turn this uh, very sort of mixed up quiver where everyone can go talk to everyone else into a tree where there's only a root and then everyone else is sort of disconnected. Um, and to do that, we start with the ear decomposition um, and look at the last edge of each um, ear in the ear decomposition. And removing those will produce uh, one of these spanning arborescences. So here I've just reproduced uh, the two um, pictures from before. So on the left is the original graph. In the middle is the ear decomposition. And I, I hope it's, it's clear why these things are called ears. They look sort of like they're glued on to the side. Okay, and, um, and here is uh, what you get if you remove all the terminal edges. So the dotted ones are terminal. So um, for example, Q3 has only one edge. So it's the last edge in the ear Q3. So we get rid of it. Q2 has two edges. The first one is U2 to U5, and the next one goes U5 to U4. So we dot out the second one. And when you remove this, and of course the last edge of U1, you have a root at U1, and then this whole thing is an arborescence. In fact, you can unfold it and make a straight line out of it. So this is what you do to pass from um, a strongly connected quiver to a straight line or, or an arborescence. And so the question is, what do we have to do to the representation so that the space of sections of this new arborescence is the same as the space of sections for the original quiver? By the way, um, finding ear decompositions is, uh, it sounds like a very algorithmically, uh, algorithmically challenging problem, but there's a super efficient algorithm by Tarjan that does this um, n log n type time. So it's not so bad. Um, okay. So let's um, take a representation A of Q and let PV be the unique path in this tree that we have this arborescence to the right from the root to any other vertex and look at all the edges you have deleted. And so those things will not contribute in the space of sections of the, of the arborescence because we just forgot about them. And each of those impose a compatibility condition, um, which is that, that um, the the value of the, um, the the vector chosen at the source has to be the same as the vector chosen at the target. So so if you look at this um, Q3 edge that we remove, um, right now there is no reason for these two things to be related along that map. So we have to add that constraint artificially because we removed that edge that was imposing the constraint. Um, so the claim is that the space of sections is precisely the intersection over all of these removed edges of the kernel of that difference, which is exactly what we need to enforce that compatibility constraint on the outside. So not a very complicated proof. So now we've reduced every um, terminal, uh, every sort of strongly connected quiver into this easy problem uh, of having an arborescence, um, taking a few of these, all of these terminal edges, looking at the difference of these source and target values and you know, crushing out that difference. So we pass to a kernel and that's it. So now 
if you had a more general scary looking quiver, which is not necessarily strongly connected, you could decompose it into its strongly connected components. They're highlighted in gray um, and then pass to this um, arborescence restricted to these strongly connected quivers by removing the terminal edges. So that's all I've done here. So there was this loop and there was this piece which we've already analyzed in the previous, um, in the previous discussion. So again, to summarize, you choose an ear decomposition for each strongly connected maximal strongly connected subquiver, and then um, remove all their terminal edges. And now you've found an acyclic subquiver. So a quiver without any cycles, which I'll call the acyclic reduction. And the goal is now to take a representation of the original quiver and again, do the right amount of surgery to it so that the space of sections is preserved. That's what we're trying to get out. Um, so for each maximal strongly connected subquiver, you pick its root and then uh, define the correct, let me go back up, uh, define the correct uh, subspace of the root vector space coming from the intersection of kernels that we saw previously. Once you have that, so let's go back here. Uh, so here are the two roots of the strongly connected components. Uh, I've just highlighted them in red. Um, and what happens is you take any vertex, let's say this blue one, and look at the set of all paths to some root. So this is one path to that root, that's another path to the root. And what's happened is that we've taken these red vertices and we have, there used to be a big vector space over them. And because we want it to be compatible across the strongly connected regions, we've cut it down to something much smaller. And what, and this, the, the targets of the matrices on top of these um, edges may no longer be living in that small vector space. And so that's the amount of correction we have to do, which is, you have replaced this A at the root with some A prime, which is an intersection of kernels. Anything that flows into the root is missing A prime, and we have to restrict to the subspace of the root uh, of this blue, uh, the vector space over the blue vertex, so that you land in the right A primes. And so that's you know, a complete summary. So you just constrain the vector spaces along all of these paths so that they're landing in A primes instead of A, the smaller correct vector space. And um, it doesn't take too much work to show that these um, edge maps send these constrained vector spaces to constrained vector spaces, it's sort of four lines. And so we form a new quiver representation, A star, where you just look at the intersection of, um, you restrict attention to all of these constrained vector spaces for each strongly connected component. And here we restrict the linear maps to these subspaces. And so here's the lemma. Once you've done this bare minimum surgery that you have to do just to get the maps to land in the right subspaces, the spaces of sections uh, of the original quiver and the acyclic reduction, this acyclification will coincide. Okay, good. Now we have reduced the problem to the case where you have an acyclic quiver. There's no cycles, but we still have this problem with the parallel edges. And so we fix that and then we're home. So for acyclic quivers, there's a flow defined partial order on the edges where you know if I can flow to you, then you cannot flow back to me. Therefore I'm before you in the partial order. So take the minimal uh, vertices along that partial order and make a new vertex, which will be our root and connect all the minimal vertices to the root. So this is our new root. These two are the only minimum, the top and the bottom are the only ones that don't have anything incoming. They're sources, but they're not sinks of any edge. Therefore, they'll be minimal. So you augment the quiver like this. And once you've done that, you extend the quiver representation by just assigning to the root the product of all these minimal vector spaces and projection maps to the new edges. So the space of sections is the same, whether you augment or not, this is uh, easy. And now we define a flow space and a flow map in, in the sort of natural way, but it takes a lot to write down with algebra. So I'm gonna try and make this as clear as possible. Um, so at the root, we just assign the same product and all the phi r's are the identity map. So that's easy. If V is not the root, then you look at all the incoming 
uh, edges. And all of the sources, we already know what the map from the roots are. And now you pass to the equalizer. So this is an inductive condition, which we can do because we have a nice partial order on the vertices. And uh, the, the rule for the equalizer is all these maps have to be the same. So you pass to the subspace of the root for which all these maps are the same, they all align, and therefore um, pick any one of those uh, paths from the red to the blue, and that gives you your, um, uh, what the flow map there is going to be at, the, at this vector space. And again, the space of sections is isomorphic to the intersection of all of these flow spaces. So that's, that's the main result, and that all lives in the root here as we wanted. So you can replace any acyclic quiver with uh, a spanning tree, a directed arborescence, and just throw out all the gray edges, for example. That's one way to do it, but there are others. And then the arboreal replacement is going to be this representation of this spanning tree where all the spaces and maps are the same, except we've changed the root. That's all we need to control. And then um, the, the proposition is that the spaces of the original acyclic quiver and this new tree quiver are, the, are again the same. So if you put together all of these propositions that I've shown you, here's the main result of our paper, which is that any old quiver you like, these four vector spaces, the original space of sections, when you reduce to the acyclic case by removing all the cycles, when you pass to the tree and just look at the root of that tree, all of these are, are the same. That's the space of sections. So um, let me uh, tell you what, what you can do with this. You can, you can do all sorts of very interesting statistics. Um, and, and maybe the, the ground zero of data analysis and statistics should be principal component analysis. So take some vectors in Rn, and define, make sure that their average is zero, just move them so their average is zero, and then define their sample covariance matrix. This is a sum of rank one matrices. So this is Y, Y transpose, not Y transpose Y. So it's not numbers, but rank one matrices that you add up. And then assuming you know that the, the eigenvalues are sort of strictly decreasing, the rth principal component is a uh, eigenspace corresponding to the rth eigenvalue of this matrix. Um, Another way is uh, to define these is by optimal, uh, by, by optimization. So it's this maximization of a trace subject to X being the orthogonal. Okay, so if you take a, a, a representation, now I'll, I'll restrict to real valued vector spaces because I want to use sort of techniques that are only available over the real numbers. Um, and let's say the dimension of the product of all these vector spaces, the total space is N, and the space of sections that we wasted a lot of time computing is, is D. Um, consider any embedding, uh, like the one we saw uh, in, the, in, in the main result before, um, of RD into the total space whose image is the space of sections. Then you can define the principal components um, to be matrices whose ith column, like all the columns lie in the space of sections. So it's just mimicking what happens upstairs, except we're restricting, we're controlling what, where the columns lie, they must lie in the space of sections. And before I say why this is a good definition, let me give you a few alternative perspectives. So here I've just reproduced what I said before, which is this trace maximization problem subject to this constraint. The other thing you can do is, um, is maximize over um, all these D by R matrices instead, where D is, again, the dimension of the space of sections, uh, where you first project. So this F transpose F is going to project to the space of sections, and then you do the optimization upstairs. And then the third one is, okay, maybe we don't have to talk about it so much. Uh, so there are three sort of very uh, related looking optimization problems that you could have used. Why did we choose the first one? Well, it's because the, they're all the same optimization problem. So if X solves the first one, then F, it is Fy where Y solves the second one and it's BZ where Z solves the third one. So they're all uh, nice. And if you remember, we defined principal components using a very spectral, they were eigenvalues of something. And so the question is, can we get that in this quiver world? And the answer is yes. And it, this was very nice because um, if, you, if you look, um, so you take the same thing, mean-centered data, 
you do the, uh, you build the S covariance matrix, and then um, the, the rth eigenvalue, uh, I'm sorry, the rth eigenvector defined in this way with this optimization problem is the rth eigenvector of this matrix pencil. So F transpose SF minus lambda F transpose F. It's the sort of rth large, smallest lambda that satisfies this equation. And what happens if you didn't have this quiver constraint is that this F transpose, um, so F is just the identity matrix. So then you reduce to S minus, minus lambda identity. And so this is sort of interleaving the properties of your data with those of your quiver and still getting uh, principal components. So you can do you know, PCA on data that, that is um, forced to satisfy some quiver constraints. Okay, I think I should stop now. So thank you so much for your attention and I'll take any questions you may have. Yeah, thank you very much for this very in interesting talk from which I learned quite, quite a lot of things. So we can ask questions because there's enough time until the break starts. So again, you simply have to put the letter Q into the chat and then, then, then I'll, I'll call you. Okay, so there's the first question by Herbert, please. Hi, Vidit. Thanks for your Hi. talk, I enjoyed it. Um, I have a question about your ear decomposition. Mm -hmm. Is there anything canonical about it? No, I've wasted so much time on that question. That's exactly what I thought. And there's, I mean, depending on where, um, even after you choose the root, like you want this one to be the root of the first ear, still you cannot get it to be canonical. Like I have examples if you really want to talk about it. There's like the well, number of ears, the, yeah, nothing is canonical. But there must be some kind of bounds how how much the number of ears can spread and stuff like that. No, I didn't find any. So I everything I know about this is in this book, uh, Digraphs by Bang and Janssen or something. I can I can send you a reference if you're curious. This is yeah, chapter three. Curious, yeah. uh -huh. It's it's an amazing book. I mean every every theorem in this is a re revelation to me because I don't know them, but. Um, um, but I don't think they even in that book, which was current as of like 10 years ago or so had any like bounds on the number of years. That's a great question. And I really spent a lot of time trying to make it canonical thinking, ah, these graph theory people probably don't know how to get uniqueness. I, it's, I, I, I have lost hope, but, but I can send you the reference. Yeah, if you send it in a chat, thanks. Yeah, sure. Okay, the next question by Francesco Vaccarino. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks, uh, Vidit, for the nice talk. Very interesting. It's a, a sort of uh, 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 flashback for me because I started my career working in representation theory of quiver and algebraic groups. So I appreciate it very much. And um, um, one question, uh, what is the complexity, if you know, uh, of finding this maximal uh, strongly connected subquiver you, you at certain point mentioned? Is it, is uh, it this, I think Constantine will tell you it's like uh, n log n or something where n is vertices plus edges. And this, again, all, all great things in graph theory are due to Tarjan, I think. So this is another one of Tarjan's famous algorithms, but it has been even improved by other people afterwards. Mm -hmm. Herbert is nodding, so I know I said something correct. I'm very happy with this. Yeah, it, it has not been improved by complexity, but there's a beautiful paper by Hal Gabo. Um, a decade or two later, where he has a very simple implementation of the uh, of this algorithm. Uh, that's beautiful. If you're actually interested in doing it, and uh, thank you. And only one other little thing: uh, if you have the n foil, imagine you have the n foil. You're, so you have one point, and mm -hmm. uh, all arrows are pointing, uh, starting and pointing to the same point several times. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and, uh, uh, what is the your trick, how it works, uh, is, is uh, maybe I didn't get uh, completely the, the mechanism. Is it trivial to apply your things to this or is it very complicated? <laughs> so basically in that case, it's, it is trivial because it's already in ear decomposition, right? Each of no, your no, edges no, are no, here. Not here. All, all arrow for, form, uh, you have the ear by each uh, loop is a, 
with the point is forming one of the pieces yes. of the composition. Yes. yes. So what I mean, what happens? Yeah, exactly. So so it's very very immediate. Each edge is its own ear. It's just an ordering of the edges. And then what happens is as you process the ears, you cut down by you know to the eigenspace of the first matrix, the eigenspace one eigenspace of the second matrix. So you just have you need a vector that's simultaneously fixed by all the matrices. And is this the composition related to uh, the decomposition of the quiver path algebra associated to the quiver? You know, this one with the impotence and so on. Do you think it's? I don't. Th I don't think it is. I really don't think it is. Okay. Okay. But but I mean I'm I'm happy to be proved wrong, but I think this is uh, much different. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, then let's move to the question by Wojciech Czakolski. Uh, that's <laughs> cheating. You've heard this before. You cannot yes, ask me a yes, second so I'm question. ready. I'm ready. No, it was a great talk. Uh, again, second time. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're no, sleeping. I, but you know what? I was thinking like most of the quiver representation that I actually know, you know, they actually have a trivial section, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, right. So that's the, you know, like, yeah. So, uh, you know, even for the representation to have non-trivial section, it's somehow you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's an important uh, part, right? I mean, the, the, most of them are do not. Uh, most of yes, them not. I, I, um, um, I think this, um, especially people who work on persistence and, and are imagining the Betty one persistence, uh, you know, along two components or something like, yeah. of course, it's zero in the beginning, it's zero at the end. So, yeah. so you have no hope of making. Um, so, I mean, there, there, there are two answers to this. Um, my favorite one right now is very, um, um, you know, you're interested in a fixed quiver representation, let's say, and all of its sub representations form a lattice. Okay. And what, what you really want to do is find a canonical filtration in this lattice of sub, uh, sub filtrations by using this functor as a weight. Okay. Um, and um, it's only left exact, it's not right exact. So there is a homology theory in here, uh, where if you try to write derive it. But uh, um, I mean, basically, to be honest with you, I, I, want, I want one of my students to sort of discover this. I've been trying to gently push in this direction and get him to work on it. So I'm not, I'm not giving you know, very well, loud I mean, the right, the this. right, the right functor are known as homotopy inverse limit, like lim one, lim two, you know. The, yeah, the yeah, other exactly. Other Exactly. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So it seems that there uh, is a major rel relation with topological field theory, isn't it? Um, are you imagining sort of uh, cobordism categories and, and so on appearing yeah. living over quivers? Yes. Yeah, maybe. I hadn't quite thought about that. I mean, are the maps going to be, I mean, do, do you pass to homology or something? How do you get linear maps? Well, I mean, in topological field theory, precisely you have vectors, vector spaces over the manifolds and each body, the cobordism def defines your linear map between these vector spaces. I so see, I is, see, I see. Yes, yes. What, what, what is happening here in, 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 in your quivers? And I, I suppose that that has been investigated I'm sure it has. I just never even thought about uh, that's a great that's a great point. But I am afraid uh, sure this is an example where 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 the there is no uh, sections, unfortunately, or you know there are very few sections in that case. I believe. Uh, I suppose so. there are not many sections, but determining those might be the few ones might be quite interesting. Mm. And uh, perhaps you can generalize that a little by, by going to projective spaces instead of vector spaces. That is, you allow identity of vectors up, up, to, up to scalar multiples. Then you right. get a little more flexibility. You, you, you get a little bit more. I mean, I've, I've even sort of played around with, uh, with different projective spaces on the vertices and, and sort of algebraic maps, just homogeneous yeah. polynomials. Uh, but everyone yeah. I've talked about this uh, about this says a it's too complicated and b much more interesting is to have uh, on each edge rather than a linear map uh, a neural network this is this is what 
everyone wants to do these days. Like, oh, why don't you just put a deep net and, you know, just have these basic nonlinearities for each map. So um, um, yeah. look at graph neural networks this way. And they're not quite quiver representations. So all of the existing linear theory is right out of the window. Um, but yeah, I, it's, these are all, it's so nice to have uh, a simple object, right? I mean, it's, it's a graph with some matrices on the edges that uh, everyone has opinions about what this should be used for. And they're all good opinions most of the time. Yeah, but I mean, somehow then you're looking at dynamical systems and as you indicated, then from dynamical systems, you have Conley theory. And if you look at Conley theory, you're, you're back in, in business, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Then, then I have, uh, I have uh, tools of my father and grandfather, but uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs>